as, um, and I said, um, I've been involved with the Zeek project for a while, and um, as the technical lead for, for many, many years, we have not very often released the major uh, version, and uh, we just did, just in time for um, Zeek Week this year. Um, Zeek 3 came out, and um, I'm very excited to uh, just recap a little bit today um, what, what came with this release, and also then foreshadow what it's currently um, on the roadmap for the next feature release that we will be planning for um, in about four months from now on. Um, so just in time, as I said, and there's really a very concise way of summarizing um, this release, and that is um, also the main reason for this, this major uh, version change, is that, well, this actually executes on that renaming that um, we announced last year um, at then Brocon. And um, so over, over the course of the year, we, we, we started changing um, both the appearance of the website, um, and more is coming there, of course, as Amber was saying, or Keith was saying yesterday, actually. And um, so this follows through on the, on the code. And what we've been doing is focusing on the user perspective of this uh, name change in terms of uh, you guys running uh, what used to be Bro, what is now Zeek, and really trying to kind of be th pretty thorough in, 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 in making the changes everywhere you can see it. So, so we didn't like go through the code and then you will still find the bro like in many of the source files. Um, but everything that, that users typically interact with at this point has switched over to the new name. And that includes, of course, like the, the names of the various binaries. So from bro to zeek, bro control is zeek control, um, bro cut is zeek cut, um, zkg is the package manager, and so on. Um, we changed the prefix where we install by default. Scripts are now dot, uh, um, dot zeek, not dot bro anymore. And even some events have changed their name from, from bro in it to zeek in it. So this is obviously a pretty dis disruptive change. Um, we have been trying to put logic in place wherever we could to make this transition easier. So, so um, wherever possible, essentially the old name for this release will, start, will continue to work. So there is still an executable called bro that you can run and all it will do is forward to Zeek and in addition like print out the little deprecation warning so that you get a kind of reminder that you should be updating your stuff. And um, that is true for the events as well. That is true for a number of things. So you might be ending up seeing um, various warnings when you um, continue to use those old names. And we will be removing these deprecation things like with the next release essentially. But uh, we are hoping that this makes it easier to uh, upgrade. In addition to this renaming, there is some new functionality in, in Zeek 3 as well, and I'm just kind of just briefly summarizing these. So we have a, a couple new analyzers, most importantly MQTT, which by default is off because it's still a bit experimental, so you need to actually set an option to turn that on if you want it. NTP is, has kind of been uh, re-added um, in, in a new form. Um, DNS, RDP, SNB, TLS have been extended, usually with more events for, for additional protocol activity. We can decapsulate VXLAN tunnels now, which is uh, particularly useful for certain cloud environments. Um, logging um, now lets through UTF encoded characters, so which is um, um, very useful and is actually the, the, the one change that made this Emojifier package uh, from Jan Gasserfer possible that was mentioned yesterday, um, because you know, can have smileys in your logs if you really want to. And the scripting language has a few um, I would say smaller additions, except for um, that, that two of them are actually a bit larger behind the scenes at least. So we can have some, some syntactic sugar for iter iterating over tables with like the key value um, pair syntax. Uh, we have Python style vector slicing. We uh, have finally case insensitive regular expressions, um, kind of convenient. The anonymous functions, that's probably the largest change even though it uh, might not be very apparent um, at first. So we always had anonymous functions where you could kind of as a, create a function on the fly essentially in a, in, a, in a Zeek script and assign it to a variable and later use it, call it. They now capture their environments in terms of their, their closure. So you can actually kind of remember like other variables outside of that function scope um, that the state those, those uh, pieces have at that point. And then you can kind of pass this function around and it will continue to have access to these, to these variables with their original values. Um, that's very helpful in, in, in certain things like, like predicates you want to maybe pass around. We can even send these uh, closures over the network using brokers. So you can capture a closure on one host, send it over to the other, and, and, and kind of execute the function over there. 
and I believe that will be enable um, some, some pretty nice functionality in the, in the communication space in the future. Um, and we have a, a new data structure called Paraglob for um, <laughs> efficiently matching strings, I guess, against large set of globs. So think about um, like long list of URLs where you want to do like, like star.google.com and you have like, like thousands of those potentially and you want to take a string and, and, and say, okay, which of these many globs does this string match? So we now have an efficient data structure for doing that and then it's um, exposed via, via BIF functions. Um, so much for the functionality. So there's one process change coming with this release, and that is we are switching to a new release schedule which addresses this um, pretty long time, a little bit of a tension between stability and features. So traditionally, our release cycle has been pretty long. So every year, on average, I think we push out a new release, which meant that people who wanted to use new features that were added over the course of the year always had to kind of switch to Git master and run like the most recent development version, which is... Um, not ideal, obviously. And um, so what we, are, what we are doing with this release is, is kind of trying to get the best of both worlds here where we um, have dedicated long-term stable releases and 3.00 is, is, is the first of those, um, which we will continue to support for a year um, with critical bug fixes. So, so if, if you want something stable and you just want it to run and keep running and, and get um, critical fixes, that's the version you can, you can go with. And then in addition to that, on top of that, um, we'll be doing um, about every four months a feature release with new features um, in the 3.x.0 space and uh, potentially bug fix releases for those as well um, as 3xy. So and, uh, and in, the, in about a year, we will kind of take essentially that last feature release, maybe, maybe do some more like, tweaks on top and, and, and cut the next stable version from that. So at that point, um, everybody can benefit from those new features, but whoever is, is a bit um, uh, more willing to move more quickly can, in the meantime, use these, these feature releases. In terms of backwards compatibility, um, our goal is to remain compatible between these long-term stable releases. So, so what usually that means if we want to, for example, remove something, we will deprecate it for one year, essentially. So, so if, we, if the first stable release will deprecate it, the next will remove it. Um, that's not always possible, but in those cases, um, because sometimes it just kind of really conflicts with development, if it kind of really holds us back or makes certain things particular, uh, especially more difficult, um, we will take it to the mailing list essentially and see um, and, and, and try to gauge the support for, for being a bit more dis disruptive. But, but this is generally the, the rule of thumb. <laughs> um, yeah, so talking about feature releases. So um, as I said, um, the goal is every four months. That means 3.1 is will be coming out um, in about that time frame. So and I think the, what, I, what I wanted to do in the second part of this talk is uh, talk a bit about what um, we see coming with that release. And um, these are kind of a few like, like larger features and capabilities that most of them, for, for most of them, the, the work has started at this point. So I'm pretty confident that, that we'll get there. Um, and some of, the, some of those, um, uh, some of you might have heard about already in, in various like, like preliminary forms. So one is, um, and this has been kind of something we want to have been doing or, or meaning to do for, for a while, is, is built-in process supervision. So if you, if you look at how a Z cluster um, is running these days, is you have these, these processes, right? I mean, the, the manager, the logger, as many workers as you need. And, and right now, there's, there's really, like, from a, from a system perspective, there's pretty much nothing tying them together except Z-Control, um, this external Python um, tool, which usually, through cron, every five minutes checks whether all these processes are still running, and then one died in the meantime, it will restart it. But it's, it's, it's a very loose form of, of process supervision, I would say. It's, it's clearly not ideal for, for a number of, of reasons, including um, deployment. So what we are... Um, working on doing is um, instead have a dedicated Zeek process take this role of the supervisor. So we will be spawning a separate process and, and all those um, manager, logger, worker processes will be childs of that so that we can actually monitor them and, and, and react to any changes instantaneously. Um, that has a few implications and advantages for how people will be running Zeek. So one is in, in this sense, 
by, by, by in, in, in the future, you will just start essentially the supervisor process and it will like automatically spawn those child processes. That means it becomes much more like a standard system service. Um, you can easily put this into, a, into, into systemd or into, into an um, init script or something and, and do a start stop or essentially on the supervisor. It's more like a, I don't know, like a web server and it's, it's, it's worker pool that it manages automatically. It will also facilitate um, running a cluster on a trace. So I, I kind of envision like having a dash J option with a number of five workers and you just seek dash J five and you just kind of in, in, in parallel process this trace. So I think this, I, I don't know what of this we will be able to get into 3.1, but I think this, this basic structure, um, I think we can get to and, and start switching to this, this new model of, of eventually, I believe, replacing Z control. Oops. Um, a second area where we've been thinking about for a while is, is how we can we provide better support for sharing state in a cluster. So, so whoever has tried to write a, a cluster aware script, right, where like the workers need to kind of share state and maybe the manager needs to know something um, about it, it's, it's pretty tricky at this point. Um, and, and, and I think there's a lot of like potential for, for higher level abstractions that we can provide. And the first one that, that, that we want to target is essentially um, a re-implementation of something we already had in the past. And that is, so, so there, there was a pretty convenient mechanism um, before we switched to broker. Um, which is the synchronized keyword. So um, for those who don't know what, what, what that meant was you would attach this to a global table in your, in your script and it would automatically, it, it means that automatically every change you do this, to this table would be propagated to all the other cluster nodes. So if, if one worker inserts something in the, into this table, it would show up at the other workers. It's very convenient from, a, from an API perspective. Um, unfortunately, it was, um, a very, very com complex to implement internally. It came with a lot of like, like um, things because, uh, or the complexity because it basically needed to try to, to replicate every possible table that Bro could represent, um, including like, like pointer reference structures and, and cycles and stuff. So there was like, a lot of complexity there. Um, I also still believe it was not always working correctly just because of like, like um, inherent synchronization issues. Um, and we decided that this is, um, at the point broker came, we decided um, we would rather start with a more well-defined approach with the, the broker data stores, which is more like a persistent hash table and you get a, the functions as an API to manipulate them. Um, so this has been in um, Zeek for a while now and then we switched over as a standard mechanism to these data stores with uh, 2.6. Um, the downside is that the API for those is pretty still, still pretty cumbersome. So you need to kind of these, wrap these in when statements and you call these the functions and, and it's not very pleasant. So this was always meant as a first step. So what we believe we can do at this point is basically go back to the previous model and, and put a global script table on top of one of these data stores. So you, maybe this is the syntax that we'll be getting to where you, in the end, you just declare the same table and just say, okay, this is, um, I want this table to be backed by a broker data store, in this case, um, SQLite data store, which also gives you persistence at the same time. And the effect is essentially the same. Things get distributed like over these workers. The model will be a bit more limited because brokers, broker data stores don't support like arbitrary complex tables. That is essentially avoiding this complexity I was referring to. But I believe this in practice, that doesn't matter much because um, from experience, what people want to share is usually structurally pretty similar information. So I think this will make it um, much easier for people to start writing um, distributed um, state sharing scripts in, in cluster settings and then we can work from there and, and, and find more abstractions. Um, another thing that, that um, work has already started on is, is the I.O. loop. That is an, in some sense a very internal thing. It's basically the main loop that Zeek uses to dispatch across various kinds of input. That is most importantly uh, packets. Um, that is uh, broker events. That is um, activity coming in through the input framework. Um, maybe asynchronous DNS responses. So they all get kind of multiplexed in terms of processing. Um, this, this, the code for this loop has, um, I would say, evolved over time. It uh, has some pretty um, nasty quirks at this point because it, over, over the years it had to account for various um, weird properties of operating systems, most importantly. Um, 
for example, I think it was previously many, many years ago where you could not reliably select on a file descriptor that you would get from uh, BPF or from libpcap. So they had to kind of work around these things, and, 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 the, and the result is that that is in a pretty bad state these days where a lot of this underlying stuff is modernized. So I think we can um, improve that. And, and just to show you, like, probably the most user-visible effect of the current uh, I.O. loop, if you just run Zeek on, on the loopback interface, and run for a while, look at top. What you see is it will be running at, in this case, like 70% CPU. And that is even though, you know, I bought this, it processed exactly zero packets. So basically, it's, it's, it's spinning a lot, and, and that is uh, clearly not acceptable in, in many environments, for, if, particularly if you're running in like, like constraint environments uh, where CPU is expensive. Um, if you don't have anything to do, you shouldn't be spending CPU. So that is something I, I, I clearly hope we can improve here, and um, work on that is already um, has made very good progress at this point. Um, another piece um, where we currently have a gap uh, and, and had, have had, had a gap for, for a while is, is um, performance, essentially reg regression testing in the performance space. So basically, um, in the past, what we've been doing uh, for new releases to understand if performance is still at the level that, that we would hope it is, we would, like, just shortly before we actually do a release, we would uh, ask, I would say, family and friends um, to, to run it in their environments and, and, and wait for the feedback to see how it, how it performs and if it's, it's um, um, basically not worse than, than the previous version. So that is, it, there will continue to be an important step because only that way we get exposure to, to read environments. However, often at that point, um, it's, it's very late to actually pinpoint any problems. I mean, even if something's not working right, I mean, you have, I don't know, you have developed for a year and it's not clear um, which change was that. So we wanna, um, at Colite, we're working on, on putting a test bed in place um, with, a, with a commercial traffic generator where we can actually baseline essentially the performance of a given Zeek version. So we would start with 3.0, and then we can continuously run, like with every change, essentially um, these performance um, um, baselines and, and uh, performance benchmarks and compare it against the baseline. So I hope we can much more easily catch performance problems that way. Um, and we do have an example in the, actually in the 3.0 release. So, so we have a regression in, with, with JSON logging performance, um, at least in, in, in very large environments. Um, the JSON logging performance has uh, decreased quite a bit. So and I think this uh, would have caught it earlier um, than this time. A second piece to the performance baselining is the cluster communication. So we are, we are, we are using Brokernow, and there's this, this other library called CAF, the actor framework, underneath. Um, we don't have a good sense yet of, of how much can this layer actually handle. And, and there, there's clearly um, room for improvement. There's also still some hacks in there to, to get the performance that, that we need in large environments. Um, however, to work on this and to really improve it, we need a way to measure if any changes um, at least don't break anything and ideally uh, improve performance. So, so we are working on a, on a communication benchmark which starts with an existing cluster configuration and essentially dumps the configure, the dumps the communication the setup is, is, is triggering, and then takes that as, as a profile to generate artificial um, traffic repeatedly um, and, uh, exhibiting the same kind of properties. So and you see this, this output here is just, uh, actually it has turned into a nice debugging tool as well. So for example, it infers what are all the topics that a node is subscribed to, because it then needs to replicate this. So this is something in progress and I think we'll also be ready for 3.1, and then in particular we can move this to the, to the uh, test bed as well, and, and baseline um, communication performance as well. Um, at the code level, so, so some modernization has started there, so we have already like, moved to like, like templated containers. Um, we will be moving more to just like standard C++ capabilities in a number of spaces, move to standard containers um, where we can, um, we are about to switch to C++ 17. Seems like compilers have caught up enough um, on various distributions that that is becoming feasible. Um, an extensive Clang tidy run is, is in progress. Lots of stuff to kind of tweak, but we will, I think, get a very clean baseline there. Maybe um, a Clang format configuration would be nice. Um, it's a bit disruptive, so we need to kind of think about that carefully because we are, we are potentially breaking um, code that is out there. And um, I, I, I kind of secretly hope that we can also start introducing um, automatic reference counting instead of like the manual reference counting that um, everybody who has worked on the code probably hates uh, just like everybody else. Um, okay, so I wanted to mention one more thing and that is in some sense it's not 3.1, 
but it, I, I, I kind of think we can get there in, in a similar time scale. And that is um, integration with OS Query, which some of you uh, might have heard about, and we have had a prototype out for a while on this, which was originally um, a student's project in, in, in Hamburg, Germany. And it's, it's working pretty well, but it wasn't like production ready. And, and um, Colette has taken this on, and, and we're working with Shred of Bits, which is an OS Query consulting uh, company, to turn this into a production ready extension for OS Query. And, and this is making good progress. Um, and uh, as I said, I think in the, in the same time frame we will hopefully get there. And, and the, the, the key piece to this is that um, OS Query allows, so maybe I should get context. So OS Query is, is this, this endpoint monitoring system, right? So you put it on a Linux system and it kind of answers queries about the system. So you can say, what are the current processes? What are the currently logged in users? Um, which files? Um, um, have been changed or created or, or things like that, which is like very complementary information to what, what Zeek derives from the network, right? So, so you, see, you see the connection on the network, goes query sees the connection on the host and maybe knows the application that triggers the, triggered the connection or um, the user that started the connection. So the so goal is to combine these two like very orthogonal data sources. And the nice thing about OS Query is that it can essentially give us a real time feed of changes on the host. So every time there's a new process, it can send us um, a notification, and in, 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 in our terminology, a notification is an event. So we have a broker connection between Zeek and OS Query, and so there is a, a new event coming over every time there's a new process in this example. And you see how this is configured here. So basically, you put in a, like a SQL-like um, statement, a query, which is OS Query's query language. And every time there's an update to this query, you'll be getting an event back, and um, it will show up um, just as a normal Zeek event, which you can then with your script code, react to. And, and some of the default scripts we, we have already, for example, just start by logging it. So you get a new log file, processes.log. And um, yeah, so I think this is, basically this is a new capability where um, we're very interested to see what people come up with um, using this for. And there, I think there will be a lot of activity. For those who have been following this for a while, um, note the new URLs down there. So basically, we have switched to new repositories because that is where these, these new versions are emerging at this point. So it's, it's not quite ready yet, but you can start watching. It's all, it's all in the open. You can start trying it. I mean, it, it does something. It's not fully stable at this point. The OS Query extension is the actual code that will be loaded as a plugin into OS Query. And the OS Query framework is the Zeek site scripting framework, which provides this API um, for subscribing. Okay, so that was pretty much the, the main pieces that um, we on the, I would say, on the core team are, are kind of targeting and currently working on. Um, that does obviously not include anything anybody else might be working on. So, so as, as usual, we are, we are very happy to um, incorporate external um, um, contributions. And generally, if for anybody who wants to become more involved with the development of Zeek, um, I mean, GitHub is our central place. So, so you, can, you can follow the activity, everything is there. You can see how the branches are developing, you can um, see the, the issues, you can file your own issues, you can, you can comment, uh, pull requests as normal. Actually, I think later in, um, we will see, uh, hear more about doing a pull request um, for Zeek. So, so that is just normal open source um, development model here. We have started to classify some of these tickets as um, either a good first issue, so if anybody's interested like in a, in a small, well-contained um, task to work on, so look for these, for these tickets. There also is another tech uh, project which is more like a, a larger, uh, sometimes substantial, um, well, substantially larger project, uh, but still self-contained in the sense that basically somebody can kind of take this and run with it if they, if, they, if they want and if they feel sufficiently familiar with what's involved. So that is something you could look for. Um, the development mailing list is there to answer questions. Um, it's also there, if, if you have an idea what you would like to work on, um, it usually works best if you, if you um, send out like a little proposal first, just, I mean, ask the community and, 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 and the team, so, so what, what do you guys think about this? Um, is this something that, that makes sense? I mean, how, is this the right way to structure it? Um, are there people maybe who wanna help? So just kind of reach out first before you start working because that way we can make sure that, that um, first we, we actually are aware of what's coming and can plan it in, and from your end that it actually aligns with, um, with the things on the, on the Zeek development side. Um, there's also um, 
a developer, developer's manual starting to emerge, uh, something we have been meaning to do for a while. Um, we have begun, we, have, we began this with, with the first piece, which is a new style guide on coding conventions. So there's actually, if you go to this URL, um, the bottom of the slides, you will find like, like things like, like how to format text and, and, and conventions for, for generally for the C++ side of the Zeek world. So and I hope you can get more in there, um, how, to, how to contribute, how to, I don't know, develop analyzers, things like that. Yeah, that pretty much concludes my talk. And um, I think it's, there's, a, there's a lot of activity going on, on on the development side these days, and, and I think there's some nice features coming, and um, we have many ideas beyond 3.1 as well. Thank you.